On Saturday morning, I stood outside our synagogue with the armed security guard we hired after the police department refused to provide us with an officer during morning services. Even the police department's limited promise of an observer near our building was not kept. And note, we did not ask for protection of our property, only our people as they worshiped. Forty congregants were inside, and here is what I witnessed during that time. For half an hour, three men dressed in fatigues and armed with semi-automatic rifles stood across the street from the temple. Had they tried to enter, I don't know what I could have done to stop them but I couldn't take my eyes off them either. Perhaps the presence of our armed guard deterred them. Perhaps their presence was just a coincidence and I'm paranoid, I don't know. Several times, parades of Nazis passed our building shouting, there's the synagogue, followed by chants of Sieg Heil and other anti-Semitic language. Some carried flags with swastikas and other Nazi symbols. A guy in a white polo shirt walked by the synagogue a few times, arousing suspicion. Was he casing the building or trying to build up courage to commit a crime? We didn't know. Later, I noticed that the man accused in the automobile terror attack wore the same polo shirt as the man who kept walking back and forth in front of our synagogue. Apparently, that's the uniform of a white supremacist group, and even now, that gives me a chill. When services ended, my heart broke as I advised congregants that it would be safer to leave the temple through the back entrance rather than the front and to please go in groups. And this is 2017 in the United States of America. On August 11th, as I'm sure you're all aware, hundreds of white supremacists carrying, cor carrying torches and Nazi flags and yelling slogans like white lives matter and Jews will not replace us descended on the quiet college town of Charlottesville, Virginia, to protest the removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Over the weekend, the protests turned violent. A woman was killed when a car plowed into a crowd of peaceful counter-demonstrators. Two police officers died when their helicopters crashed on the route to the rally, and dozens of others were seriously injured. The words I just read belong to Alan Zimmerman, president of Congregation Beth El in Charlottesville, where my friend Rachel serves as a new rabbi. And I just can't stop reading his piece. I'm reading it over and over and over again. When I wake up, before I go to sleep, which is a terrible idea, at 4 a.m. when I'm suddenly awake for no reason at all almost every night this week. I am sick, as a Jew, of course, as a part of a community that racists and bigots always seem to circle back to regardless of the beginning of the conversation. But it's more than that. I am sick as a human being, and I'm sick as an American, and I've been struggling to find the words to share amongst the videos and the articles and the stories and the quotes that are simply in unescapable. And so I look to our sacred text for guidance. There's a story we tell in the Jewish tradition about the tribe of Amalek. We were refugees from Egypt, fleeing through the desert with danger at every turn. We faced enemy tribe after enemy tribe, and yet none were like Amalek. Amalek, the rabbis taught, always attacked the rear of our encampments, where the most vulnerable in our community were, the sick, the elderly, and the young. Because of this, because they targeted those who were the most vulnerable, we were commanded to wipe out Amalek wherever we encountered them. An eternal command, our Torah teaches, for all generations. If you come upon Amalek, you must destroy them. But as time went by, our sages realized that Amalek wasn't an ethnic group. It was an inclination in all of us, in all of our societies, just waiting to bubble back up to the surface. An inclination to target the most vulnerable, to preserve and enrich ourselves by oppressing the other. And in every generation, we are told, Amalek rises again. And in every generation, we are obligated to fight back. Now, as an optimistic sort of millennial, I had really wanted to believe the redemptive stories that told me that the war had been won, that a more inclusive world was inevitable, and I wanted to believe that we were on an unstoppable train toward a land of dignity and equality for all. 
a world where it could be taken for granted that black lives matter and that women's rights are human rights, that love is love. I really wanted to believe that America was different, and I wanted to believe that we were all on the same page and that that page spoke to a better future. And I wanted to believe that Amalek had been defeated. Seventy years ago, six million of our people were murdered, including a million and a half little kids who never got to grow up. But I laughed at those in my community who would say, America is the only country that Jews haven't been oppressed and exiled from yet. But just in the last year, in my own small circle, my friends have been threatened online for being Jewish. My seminary has been painted with swastikas. Teenagers have come to me with stories of slurs screamed and pennies thrown on the ground in front of them as they walk through the halls of their high schools. As our rabbis taught, Amalek returns in every generation. And make no mistake, this is who we are fighting. It's Amalek. It's Amalek with swastikas and tiki torches marching through the streets of Virginia, crying out that they will take back their country from the Jews. And when I look at those faces, not even covered in sheets, not embarrassed at discovery, when I see the flags and the swastikas and the Southern Cross, I am filled with rage and righteous hate. But as our American prophet, as Dr. King, may his name be blessed, preach, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And as Jews, we are taught over and over and over again to care for those in our society who are in need, widows, orphans, strangers in our midst, to harness our love and to give it away freely, and not just to those who are easy to love. It's in our blood and in our history, in our culture and in our nature to build this world from love. Amalek isn't back. If we think that, it's time to check our privilege. Amalek never went away. In every generation, our rabbis teach us Amalek rises again, and in every generation, we must find the holy chutzpah to stand together and to push back. And so it's time to push back. First, use your voice. Call your elected officials, not just once, but every single day. Call them when you sit down in the morning, after you read the news and check your Twitter feed. Call them on your way to work, Make sure that they know their constituents are watching and that they know what's important to you. Number two, stand up for righteousness at every opportunity. That means not ignoring your family and your friends who are supporting white supremacy, violence, and bigotry on social media or at your Shabbat dinner table. This isn't a joke. It's not a drill. This isn't politics anymore. This is a battle between right and wrong and, dare I say, good and evil. Three, be an ally. I'm not going to read the whole poem, you know, the one that starts, first they came for the socialists. But it's time to check our privilege at the door and link arms with other minorities, other faiths, other communities being targeted in this country with hate. So don't just speak up for the Jews. Even though men waving swastika flags on a college campus might feel particularly devastating to us. Call your black friends. Call your gay friends, your Mexican friends, your Muslim friends your Chaldean friends, your trans friends, tell them that you love them and ask what you can do to help. And last, but certainly not least, join us at the Holocaust Museum uh, on Wednesday evening for a tour and a discussion because never again just might be right now. We will not stand idly by. We will not gloss over or disregard or justify. We will be the light unto the nations. We will stand up for what is unequivocally right we will do God's work on earth as we strive for liberty and for justice for all. So today and every day, we work for peace with our heads held high. Shabbat Shalom.